that the live stream is going. All right, Jen. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we'll start about one minute past the hour. Uh, while we're waiting for people to fill in, let us know in the chat where you're joining from. I'm in cloudy, not so rainy at the moment, Seattle. We've got a uh, couple others in Seattle. We have Spain representative, San Jose. So tell us where you're joining from. All right, we've got about another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get started. We've got Stu in sunny Sandy, San Francisco. Hopefully it really is sunny down there. Welcome, Stu. Okay. We will go ahead and get started in just a moment. Just waiting for a couple more people to filter in. Hi, Shaw, welcome. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jen Guile. I'm a product marketing manager here at Nginx, and I'll be moderating this panel today. Um, I'm sure not everyone here is familiar with Nginx or our parent company, F5. So before we get started, I'll just give a quick overview. As consumers, we've come to expect really rich digital experiences, and not just from the likes of these logos on the screen, but from every organization that we encounter. It's in how we research products, access financial information, arrange travel, or even interact with our healthcare providers. In fact, we heard from a large insurance company that their customers compare them to Facebook and Google. And if their homepage doesn't load in under three seconds, lose customers. Much of this is accomplished with apps. And of course, given that we're here today to talk about Ansible, you know that automation is a key component. At F5, we help enterprises deliver digital experiences through our core product groups, Big IP for simplifying traditional application delivery, Nginx, modern apps, Shape for securing apps anywhere, and F5 Cloud Services for unlocking app insights at scale. And so I'll introduce the panel in just a moment. You may have seen that we dropped a little link in the chat, or you might have heard from our virtual booth already that we're running a survey right now. The Nginx product team would like to get some feedback on how people are using Ansible roles and collections. And so if you click that link, uh, over in the chat, you can take a two-minute survey, give us some information about how you're using roles, and enter to win a $100 gift card. So please do that. We would love to get your feedback. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel. So we'll unshare for a moment. All right. So first up, uh, Alessandro, will you introduce yourself and tell us your Ansible specialty? Hey, I'm Alessandro Falgarcia, technical marketing engineer at X, and I am the main developer of the Ansible Nginx collection. So that includes the Nginx role, the Nginx config role, and uh, the, well, those two really. And then we, the collection also includes the Nginx app protect, which Daniel mainly develops. So that's a good segue over to Daniel Edgar. Daniel, give us a, a quick intro. Hey there, got my unmute. Um, I'm Daniel Edgar. I'm a product manager in uh, the Nginx group focused on application security. And, and as uh, Alessandra said, yeah, I was the original contributor for the Nginx App Protect Ansible role, which is now part of the collection. And we actually have a few um, core contributors associated with that now. So nice to meet you all. Thanks, Thanks Daniel. We'll go ahead and uh, stick with the Nginx theme, tossing it over to you, Brian. Give us a quick intro. Okay, Brian Elert. I'm a technical product manager over on the Nginx controller product. And I've been primarily developing the Nginx controller 
uh, Ansible roles and collection uh, as those relate to the controller world as you might grow, grow and introduce controller into your environment. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Forrest. Hey, I'm Forrest Crenshaw. I'm a product management engineer for the F5 Big IP Ansible modules and roles. So the uh, modules that you've seen uh, on GitHub for a while now and included with Ansible, as well as the roles that are on Dev Central. All right, and last but not least, Payal. Hey, I'm a Piloting Solution Architect with F5. Uh, I'm a part of uh, the business development team here at F5 who uh, works very closely with different partners and uh, Ansible being one of them. Uh, so we've been working with them for over five years and you know they've been absolutely wonderful uh, to work with as a partner. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So uh, before we jump into the q and I want to remind everyone we do have the chat here. So if you have questions for our panel, please drop them in the chat and uh, we'll surface those and answer them. We're planning on a couple of discussion topics. So the first part of the panel talking about Ansible role collection development. And the second half, we'll talk a bit about practical application for, um, for our roles and collections. And so let's go ahead and start off with uh, a softball here. I'm gonna toss it at Brian. Um, why use the official F5 Nginx roles and collections instead of building your own? We know there's a lot of people out there who do build their own. And so um, tell us, what's your thought there? So, uh, yeah, this is actually something that I that I kind of talk with internally as I talk to our, to our sales engineers and sales architects and within the company. Um, quite honestly, there's a lot of things that we build into into the roles and collections that, that we produce. One, they're, they're supported by the business, right? We make sure we provide quality around those things. But kind of one of the most valuable things that we put in them is we build a lot of error handling uh, into those roles to make sure we catch those errors and we pull those errors back up and we're responding to to the correct states. Um, th things that, uh, you know, when you when you first start building a role for a new product or something like that, you might not necessarily put in there just because you don't have enough depth of knowledge into those products. But we actually build build those right in up front. And it's really designed to give quick success uh, so that you can pull those things and you can start to put them into your place and in, in your workflows as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, so along a similar vein, Ansible collections were introduced last year. And I think some people are still probably wondering why they should care about collections. And I know, Forrest, you're passionate about this. Why don't you start us off? Why should we care about collections? Yeah, collections really offer you a single package to get functionality right from a vendor. So rather than having to manage my roles, uh, my modules, my connection plugins independently, we can rev these as together and release them as a collection. So I know that if I get this collection, all of this kind of, as Brian mentioned, has been tested together and works. I don't have to piecemeal my automation environment together. I can get the collection for the use cases that I want because the use cases are what give us value, right? It, it's cool to be able to turn individual knobs, but until you have uh, value out of that, then there's no reason to use it. So a collection allows uh, us to deliver value to you uh, packaged together. Great. And so you mentioned testing. Uh, let's go over to Alessandro. You just released the Nginx core collection. Tell us what kind of testing do you do as part of the collection? How do you future, uh, future proof? How far back do you test? So what, uh, well, back before developing the collection, we developed quite a robust, um, testing infrastructure on each role using molecule, which I'm going to assume most people are familiar with Ansible. I have at least heard of Molecule. That enables you to create a set of, very easily create a series of tests across multiple distributions and check for the things you want your roles to have, such as see the potents, make sure that you know everything gets deployed correctly with some verification tests. And since every role already has that built into it, every role in the Nginx collection already has that built into it, when it comes, 
when creating the collection, since the collection is just really a collection of those roles, you kind of already know that the roles will work as you expect. As far as testing back, we made, we made the decision some time ago to only support the sub maintained Ansible versions, which as of now today is just the current release and the previous release. So that simplifies the testing pipeline quite a bit too. And then uh, Paola Forest, do you handle anything differently, similar philosophy? I think it goes pretty much um, the, the same path fr from the, the big IP side. There's not too much variance there. Yep. Okay. So um, this is a question primarily for Brian and Daniel and Alessandro. Uh, unlike Big IP, Nginx doesn't use modules. And so tell us a little bit about why that is, why modules aren't necessary for Nginx. I'm going to let Dan jump onto that one first before we before the rest of us dive in, <laughs> dive onto that one. Go for it. Um, I would say early on, you know, that might have been the case where whenever you introduce custom code, you're, you know, you're raising your likelihood that uh, you've got more cyclometric complexity, you've got something that requires more testing, something that has more, you know, conditional logic in it that you need to manage and take care of. So um, the code you don't have to write is ultimately the goal here. So the way that the core set of modules and and uh, tasks in, in um, Ansible has grown to be so mature, um, for the most part, we don't really have to have anything custom. We're able to use a lot of the native um, packages that come within the Ansible distribution, again, the, again, the core installation, um, without even requiring anything from the community. Um, I, I guess, you know, uh, is code, in any case, you know, although it's fun, it is a liability, and it means you have to take care of it, you have to maintain it and whatnot. So fortunately, there's a stable basis of core modules that we can use and leverage within our playbooks so we can get our job done and maintain it very, uh, very easily long, uh, long term. That was a pretty verbose answer. I think it kind of gets we'll back to Daniel, what, we're, what we were talking about before is delivering the value to, to the customer, right? If there's not a need to write code to deliver the value, then you don't, you shouldn't write the code, right? Yeah. And, and I guess just a quick follow up is, you know, for the most part, <clears throat> there is a lot of, um, a, a lot of our packages. Uh, I'll use Brian, uh, the, the controller collection, for example, um, with few exceptions is mostly using URI modules. It's providing a lot of value in terms of flow and expected responses and item potency there. However, he doesn't need to write his own, you know, he doesn't need to do his own request library work in Python. That would just be silly. And for some of the other packages, it's really about pushing configuration files. It's about ensuring uh, dependent packages are installed. It's about ensuring that um, uh, the package management uh, tasks are being put into place to install things. And frankly, that's not anything we have to build ourselves. There, uh, It's value that is uh, inherent within, within the base uh, uh, Ansible automation platform. Right. I mean, just just to add to that, Dan, that, that you filled in that you filled in so wonderfully. I mean, we we took the thoughtful approach of can we build everything on top of what is what is available in core, which takes a combination of in our case the API that we're interacting with and the tasks that we want to perform. And then can we we and then can we construct those tasks in in a way that they're they're natural to reuse, right? So as as we go down through our use pattern, yes, you might put a playbook together and you're invoking one role and then the next role and then the next role and then they all nicely feed into feed into each other. And we've really done that thoughtfully by design so that things don't exist in a vacuum. But at the same time, we consciously avoided you know things things that that would require a module in our case because it is a rest api that, that we're dealing with so it's just that you know consciously how do, how do we interact with those things from a task what do you want to get done perspective okay have we 
immediately. Um, how about this one next? Uh, we've got a question around uh, community contribution official roles. What's the best way for people to contribute? Who wants to grab this one? I can take that one. Uh, well, all of our roles are on GitHub. Thanks, which Alessandra. All of our roles are on GitHub, which makes contributing very, very easy. You just need to visit the, uh, at least for the Nginx roles and collections, you just need to visit the Nginx and GitHub organization page. And from there, just find the repository that hosts the role or collection you want to contribute to. And, you know, if you found a bug or have an issue or need some help, you can very easily open an issue. And if you want to contribute to the code base per se, it's very easy to submit a pull request to. You'll find that at least all the roles within the Nginx collection and the Nginx collection has some uh, contribution guidelines, which specify very clearly what we want from you before you submit the PR and what we're looking for and you know how we're gonna test the role, how you can add tests. So it's all pretty well covered. Well, and I then, think that's a, uh, in terms yeah. of what might sometimes, oh, sorry, looks no, like we've got a little delay. That, Go that, ahead, that, Brian. That, that, that's that's all right. I was going to kind of add to that from Alessandro's perspective, um, because of how we maintain these roles uh, and how we maintain how we maintain the the, the collection. Um, so what? So when you're looking at at contributing to another another good guideline is because of the way we maintain these is to focus on the role itself, the the individual task, and then it's it's a lot easier for for us to consume those changes in, to ch take those, provide feedback, and then roll those into collection and release them as a unit. So whether they go back up to Galaxy as as a as a collection version or into Automation Hub as a collection version. I think that's important to note is that the, the, the rev of the role, the revision of the role and the collection can be different, right? So it allows us to take all that functionality, the changes to the functionality, all the GitHub issues that were opened across uh, Nginx and Big IP, and then release the collections for Nginx and Big IP once that functionality or that value is then added to the customer. Right. And it also allows you to kind of manage your, manage your risk as well. So if, you, if you're really tight with your versioning, say your product is not revving and you wanna be really strict with your versioning, the collections are really, really easy way to do that because you can, you can pin to a specific version. If you know the product's gonna be revving underneath you and you don't wanna take the risk of say, we, we always want the latest, greatest version of this, of this particular role. Not all the roles have versions internally, but the collections, the kind kind of safety safety mechanism on that, where we might be continuing to take changes into into the roles and and develop those and whatnot. And if you don't want to take that risk, then you can you know turn back over to the collection to go back to an earlier question and and minimize your risk. And so when people oh sorry delay again sorry. is that you feel? Sorry, Jen. Yeah, yeah, just to add to a contribution. So, you know, contributing can be not just to what's already developed for the roles and collections, but, uh, you know, as a customer or a user, if someone has some great use cases that they use in their environment and they kind of want to, you know, contribute it back so that uh, we can possibly include it in our official release, uh, you know, that's a great way of contributing as well. And are there any um, tips that you have for uh, when people contribute, if there's anything that tends to get overlooked that would make those contributions more successful? I think it's Alessandro mentioned, I think testing is the big one there, right? Um, the functionality, you know, the whole life cycle of getting functionality into a role, a module, a collection, and then releasing it, um, you don't want to, we don't want to do that and release it to other customers unless there's solid testing around it. So simply updating a parameter, a function within a pull request or requesting just that functionality be added, you want us to be testing it. So, so if there's a pull request, adding the testing according to the guidelines that are within uh, the specific GitHub re repo uh, really add to the speed at which that feature can be um, accepted. 
And so uh, how often do you release? We have slightly different release cycles, I think, between big IP and Nginx. So Forest, what's your re release cycle look like? Yeah, so we aim for around every uh, six weeks. That being said, if, if there's a, a critical patch or a feature, we can release any time that we need to, which is another great value of uh, what collections offer, right? You can rev an individual vendor's collection without impacting your entire Ansible environment. Um, so we release, we aim for every six weeks to give some consistency, but then we release when that value is there. And over on the Nginx side, who wants to take this? I'd say for the Nginx and Nginx role, there's no set cadence for releases. And usually new release gets wrapped up whenever there's enough content to make the new release valuable. That being said, as Forrest was mentioning, if there's maybe a critical bug fix or you know some major change that uh, occurs within the role that gets wrapped up and released immediately. And I'm going to say for the controller collections, it's the same. It's the same kind of pattern. Uh, we don't have a we don't have a regular cadence. Um, quite honestly, maintaining the roles is not my full time job. So it's a it's a it's a part time job. So just like the people that contribute from the community, um, we may we maintain these for for the benefit of the community. So as the product changes underneath and um, I need to expose, say, new capabilities of the product or we have some new task or workflow um, that that customers might want to might want to focus on, because as working with customers, we've we've figured out that we have some we have some gaps and they they need some examples and and some safety in getting started, then we'll add those in and and develop those uh, roles. Literally, we maintain an update as necessary. Um, but as far as revving the collection, when we've got a when I've got a, a bug or a fix to bring in there, or what's actually been more likely when I add have to bring in new capabilities that the that the product supports. And I think you already answered it a little bit, but in terms of deciding what to prioritize for role and collection development, um, Brian, you mentioned uh, identifying gaps. Uh, what else goes into deciding what you're going to develop? So, from from my perspective, I focus since we're we're product I'm product aligned, right? So I'm I'm aligned to this Nginx controller product. So it's really around the scenarios that that either make sense from an automation perspective. I mean, we really want to pick up those those scenarios that a, that a customer is really going to drive through through their pipelines, make sure we do really, really well at supporting those scenarios. And then there's going to be kind of the less important scenarios, things that, yes, you might automate them, but they're they're a little more bespoke. They might happen once a year, once a once a quarter, so, something like that. And those we're, we'll put a secondary priority on that. Um, and as we do events or, or webinars or whatnot, uh, you also see a set of examples, uh, playbook examples that I might be build, building around those things, which I actually maintain those separate um, from the collection and the role. So the playbooks kind of stand on their own. And, and the examples as we go through workflows, as we might do a presentation uh, for, a, for a webinar, for example, for Ansible, I've got a set of regular you know, Ansible workflows. And I also have a set of tower specific examples for the tower demos I've done um, so that we can support the the different scenarios and the, the workflows that we're building, the plays that, that we're building to support those actually follow follow along with those scenarios, which are built on real things that, that customers want to do. And I guess that's the real emphasis when it's something when it's something that's real that customers want to accomplish, those things always go to the top of the list. And uh, if I could add, I, I think there's probably, in addition to what Brian said, there's probably three other signals we look at as well. I mean, obviously what customers want to do, expanding those use cases, making, uh, you know, providing more options for use of uh, uh, in the control, in the con um, collections, more use cases. But yes, we need, we tend to look at issues lists, things that are uh, either reported there or nice to have as an input for things we work on. But there's also two other fronts that we need 
um, that we continue to balance when looking forward to uh, a decision whether or not to update a role. Uh, one of those is product updates. Obviously, when we update our products and we make changes uh, for the components underneath that we are supporting, we need to update our roles uh, to use those latest, uh, the latest features that customers are going to expect in there. So it's important to keep up on that product release cycle and get them out there in a timely manner. And I guess another thing, another example is also continuing to evolve with um, what the uh, what's happening with the automation platform. So, for instance, we need to consistent consistently be vigilant to see, hey, am I using uh, something that is going to be uh, deprecated soon? Am I on the latest version of the linter? Am I testing things properly? Am I adapting to uh, the, the architecture of the platform and putting those changes into place? So there really is, in summary, you know, several different vectors or inboxes we use to determine when we make changes to the role because um, the motivation is different for uh, different kinds of changes in that regard. I think on that same note, Daniel, a platform consistency, right? So with Ansible, there may be suggestions that we communicate as a partner with where hey, we need to have this type of connection plugin or this way of doing things. We want to make sure the user experience with leveraging Ansible, not just with F5 products, is consistent across Ansible in general, right? So those there's a, there are extra exterior motivations and drivers for changes as well. And we always try to be transparent with uh, changes like that that are made. And, and just uh, to add to that, like not only just core uh, feature changes, but uh, you know, also there are like so many customer requests around uh, multi-cloud. So just kind of keeping that in mind and how these roles and collections would work, uh, you know, in different environments, especially when it comes to bringing up the infrastructure. Uh, so that's also something to keep in mind while you know working on these roles and collections. Okay, uh, while we're on the topic of roles and collections, we've got one last question before we switch over to practical application, and that's what's on your roadmap? And so let's start with Alessandro. What's coming up? Well, I think the main thing to mention is that the Nginx config is due for a templating refactor using macros, which will help make, which will help maintain and sustain uh, the role long-term much easier for me and for anyone else trying to contribute towards the role. It also make it much easier to implement new templating functionalities into the role. So I'd say that's the main thing coming up. Great. Uh, Daniel, I think you've got something as well? Yeah, um, I think, you know, we've, that's been a big part of this last month's work in uh, roles, getting them all up to speed in terms of uh, packaging and, and uh, with an emphasis on testing coverage. But, um, you know, being able to use something like Molecule, especially with the uh, Ansible verifier is really powerful. However, um, you know, the linter or that process doesn't really tell you if you have enough or appropriate testing coverage. So again, uh, doubling down on that, making sure we have all of our use cases covered, I think is gonna be a future investment for us to make sure that you know all those conditionals um, are being handled and being exercised via that role. Because I, if, if someone knows of one out there that can let me know in, uh, of a way to test for uh, coverage at a role from a role point of view, I'd be interested in hearing it. Other than that, it's, it's pretty manual. And I think we need to continue to uh, explore and create tests for those particular uh, use cases in the role. Uh, beyond that, I think we need to do, uh, we need to a little bit more expansion around uh, scenarios in which we run the molecule tests against, you know, all the variants of the operating systems we support, as well as that temporal view. You know, do we need to expand testing back several versions of the products we're supporting? So those things are gonna be under, configure, uh, under consideration for deeper and more consistent testing use. So you as a user, and you as a contributor can be sure that, or you don't have to blindly uh, have faith that we're testing everything. You can, when you pull the product down, project down yourself, or you wanna go look at uh, maybe our Travis CI builds that they're passing in there. We have the appropriate amount of depth and uh, case coverage on our testing there. All right, um, Brian, anything to share from a controller perspective? Uh, yeah, so from the controller world, if we were to, it's going to be more about functionality and about the um, 
variable file samples that I have contained within contained within the role. So we're we're kind of pretty f flexible with the way we've structured the role. Um, but what we do have is we do have uh, constant changes in capabilities of the platform that, that are happening separate and underneath us. And we do have some, some big capabilities that are in the works and are gonna be coming soon that we will be incorporating into some of the roles to make sure that we can adapt to some of those scenarios and, and, we, and we set them up correctly. Um, so a lot of them, the roles are hanging out there and you might not see much much for examples yet because the capabilities weren't fully baked. And that we, we do have some, some of those that are, that are gonna be coming online and new support scenarios. So we wanna make sure we gather those as well as some other options that might be really, really useful for, for customers to, to if, if nothing else, to, to keep customers out of consoles because um, that's that's one of the that's one of the benefits of these things too is if we can come up with workflows that may it might not be interacting with the product but it might help you actually support the product and I'd like to work at getting some of those things in there as well. Okay, Forrest, what do you have coming up? Yeah, so from the big IP side, other than the the day in day out, you know, um, GitHub issue work and feature ads to our current collection. Um, I think this kind of brings a lot of our conversations full circle, right? Use the right tool and right automation for, for the right use case. And so we have in recent years added a lot of declarative APIs on top of big IP through the F5 automation tool chain. So we will be releasing new modules that support that. So the modules will be leveraging and so we'll just send those declarative APIs, which handle the item potency on the backside uh, to update your app services, your onboarding of big IPs, exporting telemetry off the big IP. Um, at the same time, these modules will be utilizing the uh, HTTP API plugin uh, within Ansible instead of connection local. So that's a minor difference coming. And you can expect these within the next few months um, to help leverage the F5 automation tool chain. Pale, anything else to share? Um, no, not, not from a product uh, standpoint, but, uh, you know, from, from, from the BD perspective, uh, you know, our, our roadmap is definitely to uh, keep engaged with, uh, you know, Ansible as a partner. Uh, the Red Hat Summit's coming next year. Uh, so whatever new stuff we have uh, from Nginx collections and, you know, F5 uh, 2.0 collections, um, you know, kind of get them out there and get people using it. Right on. All right, so if you're just joining us, we have been talking about the F5 philosophies and um, uh, roadmaps around role and collection development. And so now we're gonna switch over to talking about practical application. But I do wanna remind everyone that we have the comment section in YouTube. So if you would like to ask a question, if you have it for a specific person or for the group in general, pop it in there and uh, we'll surface it up and answer it. And so on the practical application side, um, Pale, a question that you said you get a lot is that how can people get their hands on or get hands on experience rather with our official roles and collections? Yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, so I do have a couple of links and uh, I'm not sure if I can share them, but I can put them in the private chat uh, and I'll do that in a bit. Uh, but yes, we do have a workshop. If you just go to, you know, ansible.com slash link light, uh, there are different exercises on uh, particularly the F5, uh, the big IP. And, you know, it kind of goes very basic, like how to like really gather facts from the system, you know, deploy a pool and virtual, really simple uh, to a little bit more complex of how would you use the Ansible tower and how would you use roles um, it does use modules as well as it uses our declarative API. Uh, so there's a lot of hands-on and it actually runs on uh, the AWS infrastructure. Uh, so if you have an AWS account, you can run the entire, what we call the provisional, which will deploy the lab for you. And then you can run exercises on top of it. Uh, and the eventual goal is to have this link line also have different Nginx use cases. Uh, so we're going to expand upon what's already there to include Nginx as well. And I'll post those links in chat. Yeah, thank you. We'll get those posted over on the uh, live stream side. Sure. So let's talk automation use cases. 
Um, Nginx was acquired by F5 last year. And we've been doing a lot of work to grow closer together. And um, one of the things that people may be interested to know is if there are use cases that include both uh, F5 products like Big IP as well as Nginx. And so, um, Brian, let's start with you. All right. Um, let, let let me let me ask you to rephrase that question for me for me a little bit there. Jen, yeah, if you could. Sure. Uh, what are do we have any use cases where we would be automating with both uh, F5 and Nginx? Uh, bringing bringing the two worlds together. Yeah, but better uh, together. Yes, right? it, it, yeah, we do actually. Uh, there are a few. There are a few use cases. There are some situations where we have prototyped some things. Uh, there and there's without getting into details. And there's some situation where it's, where we're going to productize some things so customers don't have to roll them, them roll these scenarios themselves um, through automation. Um, so. You know, Ansible is one of those great tools where you can literally, as a customer, automate all the things. So, say if you're using Nginx or if you're using Nginx controller to to drive Nginx, um, you can use that in a in a whole bunch of different personalities. I I call it. So you might be running web proxy, web servers, wh whatever you might be doing there, and then you still might want uh, the advanced capabilities of a big IP sitting in front of those as your kind of disaggregation or load balancing layer in, in front of those instances to take advantage of those higher level, those higher level capabilities, you know, bot protection, D DDoS and, and whatnot. So you would, you would have the workflows where you would be providing configurations to the back end, and then you would be you know, providing new configurations to your front end to accommodate change that, that you've had at those instances. I mean, there's a there's a long history of thinking as of the network layer as um, full of instances that are a bit more long lived. They're they're less they're less ephemeral. If you think of the the mantra as of, of cattle not pets, um, but but there is a there is a tendency for those those machines and and systems to run longer. So we we tend to think about them slightly slightly differently. But yeah. One of the one of the primary scenarios that you might think of is um, I've either got web servers or I've got reverse proxies, and I need to add another layer of protection in front of those. But these web servers and proxies, they might be managed by a team that's not the networking team. So we need to have some automation and some workflow to deal with the fact that there's that there's scaling actions that are happening here on these back end on these back end machines. So they uh, your your pool list might be might be expanding and reducing or changing, or you might need to direct over to a different uh, Kubernetes ingress node or or something like that. So a lot of it's dealing with these change in in your environment and how can you, how you can accommodate that within your product workflow. Yeah, it and Brent, Brian really covered my sentiments on that. Um, again, it's the idea where. We're, we're bringing the technologies together and honestly uh, having, you know, automation um, tooling there specifically in, in, for, for my interest, it's, uh, you know, Ansible roles and playbooks is not really, um, is not really a special feature. It's an expectation. So when I'm working with solutions, architects and engineers out there that might be coming up with a cohesive solution that might use some of uh, big IP security features on the front end or the edge, and then something like uh, our Nginx WAF closer to the applications themselves, I'm going to consider using something like our AS3 based uh, roles that, that Forrest was talking about and Payal was talking about. And I'm going to use our core collection on the inside. Never build anything manually, as Brian said, uh, automate all the things if you can. I, th I think that brings in uh, a great lead into um, leveraging the declarative tools on Big IP can do di uh, can perform dynamic service discovery based on environments such as public cloud, right, AWS, Azure, ECP, etc. Um, and so, if you have an ephemeral Nginx environment that is standing up rapidly, which is a strong point of Nginx, right, uh, you can have Big IP pools dynamically updating based on what is in those environments. So, if an EC2 instance with a certain tag 
uh, loads in AWS, I can have my big IP AS3 automatically update uh, based on that. And so AS3 is deployed via Ansible. The deployment of the Nginx instance instances are deployed via Ansible and it all synergizes together to give you a complete solution. Okay. Uh, one big closing question that I'll be curious if we have agreement on or if we, we get a debate is what's the single thing I can automate that would save me the most time? Whoever wants to go first can go first. So I think, I mean, you know, I'll give the, I'll give the easy answer, which is it depends, right? <laughs> and there are some, there's some really specific answers out there that I've seen. Um, I can tell you as a customer, uh, before I uh, worked for F5, I was a customer and I looked at the set of tasks that we, my team dealt with day in, day out. And I didn't pick the most complex one. I didn't pick the one that, hey, this task takes me three hours every time. Uh, I picked the one that was the easiest to automate. And I feel like that's the, the best answer is if you have one task, even if it only takes 5% of your time, if it's, if it's gonna take you one day to automate that, well, you just gain 5% of your time, right? If you want, if you have a task that takes thirty percent of your time, it's going to take you two years to automate it. it. It's it may not be worth the investment, right? So it's really coming down to the per task investment uh, and what you'll get out of that automation, right? I think Brian mentioned it earlier, right? If it's if something you do once every two years, uh, you probably shouldn't spend your time doing it. It's something that you do relatively frequently um, that you can quickly gain that time back by automating. Yeah, then yeah. I would think. Um, uh, I, that's a really great answer. So from, I guess, an academic point of view, you know, I start with, okay, I should probably automate the things where um, time, you know, ultimately not, not at first, uh, you don't want to automate high risk things first, but focus on deploying, uh, automating your deployments, right? So you get that consistency, you get that predictability. But with that, don't forget to automate your rollback strategy. So you can, you can, um, use your automation framework to very quickly work at speeds and pace and completion and consistency that any human can't be with manual processes. But aside from that, um, let, let's be honest, most of what we do, all, all of us here at this conference are, um, it is really a creative profession, or that's a big portion of what we're doing when we're trying to improve processes. So don't forget to automate the things that provide you zero joy, right? Take take the the most boring things, that really don't get you up out of bed and start with those, automate those kinds of things, get consistent at it, get good at it. Obviously you don't want to pick high risk things at first, but, but um, you know, bring some joy back to your job, automate the, the cruft that you don't want to care about. That way you can wrap your head around larger problem sets and continue to invest in your career in that way. That would be the only thing I add. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and for me personally, uh, I mean, you know, I have a lab environment and just setting up the lab environment is probably the most boring and mundane thing. And I try to automate as much of that as possible. And I, I'm sure 90% uh, of people have a lab they want to maintain. And it's as simple as that to get started and then move to bigger use cases and, you know, deployments. Uh, you know, I would say for someone to start with automation, you know, go more for config management more than uh, setting up your infrastructure because that's uh, you know smaller easier to get started and then move to the bigger picture yeah config management definitely has less dependencies right you do infrastructure you have dependencies on everything in that infrastructure how everything connects right yep. um, it, get, it gets vastly more complex i would say one practical example that comes to mind is data center routing so if i have multi-region applications which is pretty common in enterprise um I, I don't want to have to have multiple teams involved when I have to make changes to my application. I need to be able to pull my application out of data center one and only have it run out of data center two so I can do changes within data center one, right? So something such as that, which is an operational task, which is done frequently, you don't wanna um, bring other people on a call to have a change window for your application that aren't involved in your application really, right? So if, if you can, uh, as a team, create a task that allows you to pull your application out of specific sites. I think I see that as a very common use case across many customers because uh, everyone has to make rolling updates to applications, right? Blue, green environments, however you want to handle that change, right? Pulling, you know, I have a cold outage in one site or you want to do rolling upgrades, et cetera. That's a really common task um, that is um, universal. Everyone needs to be able to revision their applications. Yeah. 
Well, and I think to to bring like some like some of these ideas together. I know for for me, it's all about to to steal a word from from the SRE world, right? It's it's uh, automate your toil um, to kind of expand on what what Dan was what Dan was talking about. And I actually look at it not uh, for, as a as a task perspective, but to take take that drudge or, I mean, if, if you're looking at a way to get started and you're not, and you're not going or, or you've got some hindrances, you know, management won't let you, let you do the time to take those things that you do that, that might be a larger, that might be a larger process and just break it down into its individual pieces. So it's individual tasks. So I, I've got to update this thing. I've got to push a file, fine, push, push a file. And then later in add how you, how you actually execute the process on the, on the remaining, you know, I need to, I need to pull a file, fine, pull a file. I need to make sure you have a configuration in a, in a specific spot, you know, just start with those, start with those little things and just go piece by piece before you know it, you end up building these, these much larger, and I'm not going to call them much larger plays, but much larger workflows because a workflow might be, might be made up of individual plays, you know, to, to keep within the Ansible vernacular of, well, I do this thing, and then I do this thing, and then I do this thing. And well, this thing is actually made up of all these little, all these little hundred, hundred of discrete steps that have to execute in a, in a specific order. That's always great stuff to pick on, but don't look at the big thing that, that you have to accomplish because that's a, a lot of times very, very daunting. Look at some of the little things. Look at some of the little things that, that you can just that you can just pick off, and then you can start to piece it together. And usually, that's that's really good momentum for for people for people to get going. Um, and there's tons of examples out there. Yeah, I was. If I were to mention one thing that I'd automate to save me the most time, it would probably be as well, other people have already mentioned probably just to automate the one thing that I do the most every day. So if there's a task that I'm doing every day or, be or you know, very frequently used task that needs to be repeated any time I deploy a new system, then that's the number one thing that I'm going to want to automate just to use, make my life easier. Yep. And All I right. Guess, so as we uh, start to, oh, sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Pam. It's okay. And then we'll make this the last comment on sure. it. Sure. I just wanted to add, like, since, you know, we're talking about our collections and roles being uh, released so frequently, uh, you know, if you write any automation for FI and Nginx, kind of make sure that you uh, also have, like, a check to update those collections and roles uh, before you run uh, your tasks, just so that you're always on the latest. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, so you'll see the banner at the bottom of the screen. Um, we have Alessandro as a, an Ansible Fest speaker. He'll be doing a session tomorrow, October 13th, uh, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. Alessandro, give us the like 30 second, what are you gonna be talking about in Nginx Better with Ansible? Well, I'm first gonna start by giving a brief overview and what Nginx is and why you'd want to use Ansible to automate your Nginx deployments. And then I'll give a brief demo showing how easy it is to use Ansible to deploy Nginx Plus as a web server and then also you deploy Nginx AppProtect to secure your web server. Excellent. And then I'm going to do a quick screen share here. Um, we have a couple more, um, sessions coming up, uh, another one that's going to be starting in 15 minutes and that is going to be over on zoom. And so we'll get that link over in the chat in just a moment. So you can jump straight into that if you're interested, we'll have Matt Quill, um, sharing how to reduce and maybe eliminate uh, microservice application downtime using Ansible featuring our a uh, global uh, load balancing tool. And then tomorrow, um, after Alessandro's session, we'll have Brian uh, talking about the Ansible collection, followed by Pal and Forrest uh, talking about F5 automation tool chain. 
Um, those will also be on Zoom rather than um, through YouTube. We're just doing the, the YouTube for this session. And so we'll get those uh, links in tomorrow at, or for tomorrow as well. And you can also return to the Nginx booth to um, get them live. And uh, again, if you haven't taken our survey yet, we invite you to do that. Um, even if you're new to Ansible, new to Nginx, um, give us some input. We're really looking to start um, talking directly with people about their experiences and what they're looking for so that we can continue shaping those roadmaps. And that's pretty much it. So if you wanna learn more, um, we have two different websites, nginx.com and f5.com. And you can toss in the uh, backslash there in order to get our, um, our pages specifically on Red Hat and Ansible. And then we're gonna go ahead and drop uh, links in the chat as well. I'm also gonna go ahead and share out our links to um, F5 and Nginx on Galaxy. We know that's where a lot of people are finding our, our Ansible roles. And so definitely check us out there. It'll get you over to our GitHub. And with that, um, oh, I see some comments. Let's see, do we have any new questions? I don't think so. So panel, thank you so much. Um, it's been a great conversation. I hope that the people watching enjoyed it. So have a great day.